Good day students, General Science 101. When we broke off last time, we were looking at the behavior of light in geometric optics. In this section, what we discussed was the behavior of light in optical properties rather than the energy properties of light. We looked at the laws of reflection of light. We said there are certain laws which are followed when we look at reflection. I, that the angle of incidence is equal to the angle of reflection. We also stated that there is a law of reversibility. In, word, in other words, the path which was followed by light in the incident, and if we reverse the roles and shine the light from the objective, it will still follow the same path it took while going in. We looked at the formation of images in plane, convex, and concave mirrors. In other words, in plane mirrors, we said the object is as far in front of the mirror as the image is in front of behind the mirror, we looked at that and we looked at the formations using the geometric optics and the ray diagrams. We looked at the formation of images in concave and convex mirror, mirrors. In concave mirrors, we have converging mirrors. In other words, parallel beam of light converged at one point. In case of concave mirrors, we had a diverging mirrors. In other words, a parallel beam of light diverged and spread out. We looked at the ray diagrams and we derived the mirror equation for concave mirrors and we said, all right, in this diagram, we, what we are going to say is anything to the right of the number line, taking the face of the mirror or the pole of the mirror as the starting point, anything to one side of the uh, pole is going to be taken as negative, anything to the other side of the pole is going to be taken as positive. And therefore, for concave mirrors, we had the uh, uh, distance to the object and the distance to the image as positive and the focal length always also as positive, where in case of concave mirrors, a couple of things were positive and something was negative. We also looked at magnification, which is basically the size of the image divided by the size of the object, and we derived the equations for that. What we are going to be doing today is we are going to be looking and trying to explain a new phenomena, which is a refraction of light, or as we say it is the bending of light when light moves from one medium to another medium. In terms of refraction, we are going to be looking at critical angles. We are also going to be looking at the lenses, different type of lenses, trying to derive the lens equation and look at the different application of lenses. Now, let me come on to refraction. Now, refraction is a phenomena in which light changes its direction when it moves from one medium to another medium. Let us say that this is air and this is water. So light, when it's traveling from air and enters into a medium, which is water, it has to change direction. On the slide, which is in front of you, you have, I have given you the general diagram, which is followed when we use, or we try to find out the conditions, what are the conditions which we use, what are the general situations which we require whenever we are looking at a refraction from one medium to another. On the diagram, you have got two mediums. One is a rarer medium, which is a top medium, the denser medium, which is the lower medium. A rarer medium, of course, would be air in our case, and the denser medium would be water. The incident ray is in air. It is moving from a lighter medium to a denser medium. Now, if you remember your diagram for the reflection, we had said that we are taking the incident angle and the reflected angle from the normal. Now, that diagram had a certain significance, which now we are applying here, so that the students do not get confused if we take some different angle of incidence. Therefore, physicists have decided that the angles are always going to be taken from the normal or the perpendicular from the surface. So in case of refraction, what we have is the angle of incidence is the angle between the perpendicular and the incident ray. This angle is known as the incident angle. The angle between the normal and the refracted ray is the angle of refraction. Now, why does light bend? What is the physics behind this bending of light? Now, let us look at example. In which medium can you run faster? Can you run faster in air or will you be able to run faster in water? The answer is obvious that a person will run faster in air because the resistance of air is less than the resistance of water. In other words, when you move from air into water, a person will slow down. And because of this slowing down, 
if you move at an angle, you will tend to have a change in direction. The same is applied when we look at light. Now, when we look at light, the light bends when it moves from a lighter medium to a denser medium, and that is basically what refraction is. When light enters a lighter medium into a denser medium, it is bent towards the normal, and this extent of bending is basically what is the refractive index, or the refractive index is defined as the extent to which light is deviated or refracted when it enters from one medium to another medium. I gave you an example of speed of a human when it is he's moving in air and when he enters water. Similarly, when light moves from air to water, its speed changes. And the ratio of the two speeds is also the refractive index. So speed in air divided by the speed in that medium, whether it is water, glass, plastic, it has to be a transparent medium because light will only travel in a transparent medium where we can measure it. Therefore, the refractive index is the ratio of the two speeds, speed in air divided by the speed in that medium. And we term this as the refractive index. Now, why do we take speed in air? Now, we know light is part of electromagnetic radiation. And electromagnetic radiation has a property that it can travel at a speed which is 300,000 kilometers per second, or in general terms, it's 3 into 10 to the 8 meters per second. This is the speed in vacuum, because vacuum and air, the speed of light does not vary that much. Therefore, we say the speed of light in air is 3 into 10 to the 8 meters per second. When it moves into different materials, on the slide which you can see right now, I have given you different speeds, and hence the refractive index which is the speed of light in air divided by the speed of light in that medium. For example, in water, the speed is about 2.26 into 10 to the 8 meters per second, giving you a refractive index of 1.33. And similarly, in glass, the speed is about 2 into 10 to the 8 meters per second, giving you a refractive index of 1.5. There are other refractive indexes listed there. For example, ethanol and diamond have also been listed on your slide. However, the two so refractive indexes in common use, which we are going to be using in our course, are refractive index for glass, which is about 1.5. It varies from 1.5 to 1.6, depending on what type of glass we have. But generally, for glass, we take the speed of light into 10 to the 8 meters per second, 2.00 into 10 to the 8 meters per second, giving you a refractive index of 1.5. And for water, we take it as 2.26 into 10 to the 8, giving you a refractive index of 1.33. These are the two values which we are going to be looking at. Now, light travels, when it travels from one medium into another, it changes its direction. Now, let us look at the, just like reflection, again, we have two laws which govern refraction. A, that the angle of inc the incident ray, the refracted ray, and the normal have to lie on the same plane. Very simply, this is the medium, a ray traveling along the table, when it is refracted, the normal is again also along the table, the refracted ray will again be along the table. In other words, the refracted ray will not rise out. It has to be on the same plane, on the same surface, which we can demonstrate. And in fact, when we take you to the laboratory to demonstrate the different aspects of this reflection and refraction of light, you will, we will show to you, yes, these laws do hold. The second thing about the law is that the ratio of the sines of the angle, not the angles, but the sine of the angle, the sine of the incident angle divided by sine of the refractive angle is also equal to the refractive index. This was a law which was discovered by Robert Snell, and that is known as Snell's law. So in other words, Snell's law basically states the refractive index is the ratio of the sines of the angle sine incident divided by sine refracted, it is also equal to the speed of light in air divided by speed of light in that medium. You can have modifications to the law if you have two materials, for example, water into oil, then it is the refractive index of water divided by the refractive index of oil will also give you the refractive index of that medium, but we are not going to be discussing that in this course. In this course, we are basically looking at air and another medium. Now, what is the differences between reflection and refraction? 
in reflection, the medium in which light is traveling does not change. You have a mirror, light comes, bounces back. This is air, it bounces back into air. However, in refraction, the medium changes. It goes from air into a different medium. It might be glass, plastic, or water, or oil, depending upon what transparent material is across this boundary. So light is traveling in one boundary, it crosses the boundary, goes into a different medium, and therefore you have a refraction effect. So refraction, a medium changes. In reflection, a medium does not change. In reflection, the angle of incidence, which is the angle between the incident ray and the normal, is equal to the angle of reflection, which is between the reflected ray and the normal. Whereas in refraction, it is the sine of the incident ray divided by sine of the reflected angle. So sine of the incident angle divided by sine of the reflected angle is going to be the refractive index. In reflection, the speed of light does not change. Because the medium is the same, therefore the speed of light has to be the same. The speed of light in air, speed of light in air. However, in refraction, when your medium changes, the speed of light has to change. So we have three basic differences here. A, in reflection, the medium remains the same. The angle of incidence is equal to the angle of reflection. The speed of light remains constant. In the refraction, we have the medium changes. The sine of the angles gives you a ratio, which is the refractive index, and the speed of light has to change because the medium is changing. Let's look at a worked example, which will give you an idea how to apply these questions. For example, on your slide, you have a material where light is traveling from air into a material, and the angle of incidence is given as 25 degrees. It is the angle between the normal and the incident ray, and the angle of refraction is in the material is 15 degrees, and it is the angle between the refracted ray and the normal, which is 15 degrees. So we have data which is available. We have the incident angle, which is 25 degrees. We have the refractive angle, which is 15 degrees. We have the speed of light in air, which is 3 into 10 to the 8 meters per second. We are asked two questions. A, find the refractive index. B, we have to find the speed of light in that medium. We use Snell's law. Snell's law simply says that sine of 25 divided by sine of 15 should give us the refractive index, which basically is 0 0.0423 divided by 0 0.0259, giving you a refractive index of 1.63 for this material. Now, if the refractive index is 1.63, then 1.63 should be equal to the speed of light in air divided by the speed of light in that material. Rearranging, we find that the speed of light in the material is 3 into 10 to the 8, which is speed of light in air, divided by 1.63, which was the refractive index of that material, giving us a speed in that material of equal to 1.84 into 10 to the 8 meters per second. Let us look at another example. In this example, what we are given is we are given a piece of plastic, which has a refractive index of 1.6. We have to calculate the incident angle if the refracted angle is 12 degrees. In the diagram, we see theta is given as the angle which we have to find out. It is the angle between the normal and the incident ray in air, whereas 12 degrees is the angle which is between the refracted ray and the normal in the material. So the data which we have is the angle of incident, theta, which we have to find out. We have to have the angle of refraction, which is given as 12 degrees. We have the refractive index of plastic given as 1.6. The speed of light in air, of course, we know, which is 3 into 10 to the 8 meters per second. And it is one of the universal constants which we have. Applying this to the relationship in Snell's law, we find the refractive index is equal to sine incident divided by sine of the refractive. We do not know the sine of incident, so we just write sine theta there, or divided by sine 12. In other words, we find 1.6 is equal to sine theta divided by 0 0.208, giving us a value of sine theta is equal to 1.6 into 0.28 is equal to 0.333. If you look it up in the tables or look it up in the calculator, just pressing the inverse of sine of 0.33, giving, giving us an angle of 19.4 degrees. So that means ray of light which strikes air at 19.4 degrees will be refracted at an angle of 12 degrees in a material which is plastic in our case, which has a refractive index of 
Now, let us look at another example. In this case, what we have is, it is shown that the ray of light is coming out of the medium. So we are given the direction of the light as coming out of the material, which is diamond, and it's coming out in air, and we have been given an angle 20 degrees, and we have been given an angle which is theta degrees on the diagram. However, if you look carefully, the angle which is given as 20 degrees is not the incident angle. Because like we have discussed time and again, the incident angle is the angle between the normal and the incident ray. Now in this case, in this particular diagram, the direction of the ray is given coming out of the denser material to the lighter material. So what do we take as the incident ray? Now if you remember from my last lecture, we said there is something known as the principle of reversibility of light. The principle of reversibility of light simply says that a path taken by light while coming in is going to be the same while going out if I replace the source and the object, I re replace them, I rotate them, or in other words, the object is taken inside the material and the source is taken out of the material, the path remains the same. Therefore, these arrows which are indicating on the diagram become immaterial and we can then refer to our standard diagram. In the standard diagram, air was the lesser denser medium and that is why the incident angle, of course, is going to be angle between the normal and the incident ray in air and the refracted angle is going to be the refracted angle between the refracted ray and the normal in the material. That allows us to use the standard diagram wherever possible. Now in this case we have the data available like I said now we have the incident angle which you have to find out the refracted angle becomes R which is what we have to find is theta and the refractive index for diamond is given as 2.42. Now in this particular case basically the angle which we have been given is 20 degrees between the surface and the incident ray. Now the angle of incidence according to our diagram is between the normal and the incident ray. Now we know the normal is always at 90 degrees to the surface, therefore it is just a simple calculation of geometry that the angle of incident becomes 90 minus 20 which is 70 degrees. Now the refractive index is sin i over sin r, so it becomes sin 70 divided by sin theta. 2.42 being the refractive index, 2.42 is equal to 0 0.940 divided by sin theta where 0 0.940 is sine of 70. Giving us rearranging, we find sine 30 is 0 0.940 divided by 2.42, giving us sine theta is equal to 0 0.388. Now because sine theta is 0 0.388, theta is going to be sine inverse of 0 0.388, giving us a value of 22.6 degrees. So in other words, using the principle of reversibility, we have ignored the arrows and used our standard diagram to find the refracted angle in the in diamond which we found the value of theta so we have found that the incident angle is 70 degrees the refractive index was given as 2.42 giving us the value of 22.4 degrees which is the value of theta in c the next part of the question of course asked us what is the speed of light in diamond speed of light of course the refractive index is given as the speed of light in air divided by speed of light in a material. We know the value of the refractive index, which is 2.42. We know the value of speed of light, which is 3 into 10 to the 8 meters per second. 3.8, 10 to the 8 meters per second divided by 2.42 gives us a value of 1.24 into 10 to the 8 meters per second. So light is going to be slower by about two and a half times when it moves from air into diamond. The speed still is very, very large and you re require special techniques to find out the speed. However, because we have found it in different materials, we can take it for granted. Yes, the speed would be this much. And that is what we do. Now, what we are going to do is look at a new concept, which is known as a critical angle. Now, if you look at the standard diagram, when a ray of light comes from a denser medium and moves into a lighter medium, its angle increases. The angle of refraction here in the denser medium which in this case would be taken as incident and the angle of a reef, the incident angle of course becomes larger like in the case of diamond, it was 
22.6 degrees in the denser medium. However, it was 70 degrees in the larger medium. Now, if we continue increasing this angle, or the incident angle is continually increasing, a point would be reached where a ray coming from a denser medium to a lighter medium will just skim the surface. In other words, it has become parallel to the surface. At this point, we say a critical value has been reached because if we go beyond this, then the light cannot escape. In the demonstration which we are going to show you, now as you will see, as we are going to increase the angle in the medium, this ray they will continue on until it is flat and then it will suddenly disappear. Once it disappears, we say a position has been reached in which the light cannot escape the denser medium. That has got a particular ramifications which we will continue on in this lecture. Right now, the refractive index is going to be sin i divided by sin r. Now, sin i in this case, because the incident ray is parallel to the surface, it is automatically 90 degrees. Now, if sin 90 we know is 1, therefore we have a new relationship which we can use, which is that the refractive index is 1 divided by the critical angle. The critical angle is defined as the angle at which if light strikes in a denser medium, it just skims the surface and if an angle is made greater than the critical angle, the light cannot escape. Let us look at an example. It says, if the critical angle of sapphire, sapphire is a material which is 34.4 degrees, what is its refractive index? Very simply, we know the refractive index is 1 divided by sine of the critical angle. Now, the refractive index will be 1 divided by sine of 34.4, and that should give us a value of 1.77. So, the refractive index of sapphire should be 1.77, and this is a more easier technique to find the refractive index because in the normal way, we have to find the sine of the incident angle, we have to find the refracted angle, we have to in fact make two measurements, and therefore two measurements increases the amount of error we make, and therefore our result can be more difficult to rationalize or become more accurate. However, in the case of using a critical angle, we have only one measurement to make, we just measure the critical angle, and therefore our errors are minimized, that is why Measuring the critical angle is a technique which physicists use to find critical angles or find the refractive index of different materials. Now, we are going to be looking at a new phenomena which is known as total internal reflection. On the diagram which is on your slide, we have a ray of light which is coming at the critical angle. Now, a ray of light, in this case, the coming from a denser medium to a lighter medium, the ray of light, of course, strikes the medium and becomes parallel to the surface. So it comes out and is parallel to the surface. Now if I increase the angle of the light which is coming out of the denser medium and take it beyond the critical angle, what is going to happen? The light cannot escape because it has got an angle of incident which is greater than 90 degrees. Now because the angle of incidence becomes greater than 90 degrees, it cannot leave the medium. Now if the medium remains the same, then of course a reflection has to take place at the boundary. So the light strikes, lights bounce back, then the laws of reflection apply. And because the laws of reflection apply, therefore we can say that this light is now not going to be refracted, rather it is going to be reflected. And the phenomena now is known as total internal reflection. By the word of total we mean that all of the light which is inside the medium is bounced back, no light escapes the medium. That is why the word total internal reflection. Now, what are the conditions for total internal reflection? The very simple conditions state that the light should come from a denser medium to a lighter medium. And light should reach the boundary at an angle which is greater than the critical angle of the medium. And like we have just stated, if the light of the angle is greater than the critical angle, then of course it is going to travel, it is going to be totally internally reflected. Now, because it is totally internally reflected, the laws of reflection are applicable. And if you remember, laws of reflection, they say the incident ray, the reflected ray, and the normal lie in the same plane, and the angle of incidence is equal to the angle of reflection. 
we do not look at the other medium and we only look at the medium which is a denser medium and the speed of light in the denser medium remains the speed of light in the denser medium. The speed of light in the medium does not change. The law of reversibility of course automatically applies and we have the angle of incidence in this case m is equal to the angle of reflection which again in this case is m again. Now this has got certain implications like mirrors. You have two types of mirrors. Now remember a mirror is normally a glass material. You have a glassy material which might have a certain thickness. Now because it has a certain thickness there are two ways of making a mirror. One is we coat this side. When if we coat this side then of course the light has to travel through the mirror to the reflecting surface and is bounced back. Whereas if we are coating the front side the light is just strikes the top surface and bounces back. In this case we have a perfect reflection. In this is known basically a front coated mirror which is normally used whenever you have got very high precision work to do. However normal mirrors which we use for everyday use are back coated. However in the back coated because the light is going to enter this material. Some light is going to be reflected from the top surface because remember this is a plastic or glass and it is going to reflect some light and some light is going to be reflected from the reflecting surface. So in this case you might have some ghost images. Now the ghost images basically depend upon what type of material the mid is, what type of coating you have and normally we do not mind such uh, ghost images because it reduces the cost of the mirror. However for scientific work we always invariably use front coated mirrors. Now how do you find refractive index in a laboratory? The technique which we have we use a right angle prism and on your slide I have the scheme which is going to be represented. We place a pin on a sheet of paper and we place isosceles prism next to that sheet of paper next to that pin as it is on the slide. Now there are going to be multiple rays which are going to come out from that source which is that pin and like we are saying as the angle of with which they are, you are striking the top surface of the prism the light can be refracted at different angles. However the last ray which I have shown is refracted just along the surface. However if we increase the angle we find that the ray is totally internally reflected and it is going to be bounced back and it can be viewed from the side. So one side of the prism is now acting as a reflector or as a mirror. We can place our eye, move it forward and backwards and we look at the images and we see the image just disappearing and the, the moment the image disappears we move our eye side back and we will then mark this as the, for example these are the three positions of the pin which we are looking at and we are going to be looking at the most bright pin next to the dimmest position and that is in fact the proper critical angle and we are going to be see that yes that we have now identified a image which is of the marker which is now going to be used to identify what the image is and there is a scheme given in your notebooks you can always look it up in the practical tables or go to a simple physics laboratory. We will do this scheme with you when we take you to the lab to how to use this to find the critical angle. Now what are the uses of this total internal reflection? The most common use which we have is in optical fiber. In an optical fiber we have a very thin glass fiber or very thin tube which is coated by another cladding or material which has got a higher refractive index than the material inside. So you have two materials of made of glass. So if the light which is coming from one side of the fiber when it strikes at the end of border edge of the fiber what we see is that it is now hitting it. It cannot leave the fiber. In other words the light is now forced to pass through the fiber and go out of the other end. Optical fibers are used in communication. There are different types of fibers. You have a single mode fiber, you have a single mode step indexed fiber or multi mode step indexed fiber 
of multi-mode graded fiber. These are just, just different names of fibers. A single mode step index fiber or a single mode fiber are used when you have a light of just one wavelength. For example, if you're using just red light or for optical communications, you are going to use a single mode fiber. A single mode fiber only has a single color in it. Therefore, you do not need any different applications of that. However, if you're using two or three or different colors, then you will require a step indexed fiber, which allows, because the different colors are going to be traveling in different speeds, therefore the step indexed fiber allows that the time of the yellow light or the red light take from point A to point B is the same, and therefore your image does not become distorted. Now, because the optical fibers are using light, therefore the if you are going to use this for transmission of signals, the speed at which the signals are going to be transmitted is going to be very, very fast. Now, optical fibers are routinely used for transmission of computer data, for telephone signals, and TV signals. It is used in, by medicine in endoscopes and for other refined scopes. Now, what is the advantages of these optical fibers? A, they are very light in weight and therefore very easy to handle. They are flexible, they can be bent and therefore they're quite rugged because the optical fiber is coated by a plastic shielding and therefore you can bend it and distort it. Of course, you cannot bend it completely that the fiber will break. It is glass nevertheless, but it can take quite a lot of punishment. It is cheaper than copper cables to make. You can make loads of optical fibers, very high quality optical fibers at a cost which is cheaper than copper cables. Copper is becoming expensive day by day because copper is now used widely in electronics, it does not have any eating effect. So light enters point A, light leaves point B. The wire is not heated very simply because light is absorbed at a minimum level inside that optical fiber. So there are absolutely minimum or very few heat losses or losses of signal or data, as you can call it. It can carry huge amount of information. The modern optical fiber techniques or optical electronic techniques can transmit up to gigabytes per second or billions of data inputs per second can be transmitted from point to A. It can carry huge amount of information, it, which is far greater than what a radio wave would be able to carry. Optical fibers carry telephone signals. Optical fibers can carry even television signals from point A to point B, and therefore it is gaining popularity rather than, and it is gradually replacing copper cables for transmission of data or computer communication. Another major use of optical fibers is in endoscopes. That is basically a use in medical physics. Endoscope is a device can, which can be used to photograph internal parts of the human body. It is nothing else but a pipe, a tube about one centimeter in diameter, which contains a an optical fiber. It can contain other pipes or small tubes through which we can either introduce a liquid or uh, have a suction or take some liquid out. We can also have a instrument there, for example, scissors are sometimes put in an endoscope in case a, a person has to do a surgery in an artery or remove a clot and then it is suctioned out. The optical fiber there is basically for two functions. A, it takes the light from a source and transmits it to the inside of the body, shines up that area, and the reflected light is then viewed by the medical practitioner through a device, or it can also be connected to a camera, which can give view it on a screen. There are different types of endoscopes. Endoscopes, just a general name, which can photograph the internal human body. If you're looking at the sore throat or a throat, then it is known as the bronchoscope. If you are using, examining the working of the liver, it is sometimes known as a cytoscope, whereas a gastroscope is used to look at the interior of the stomach. Different names because there are slight differences in the usages of the or the different instruments which are put in that tube. An endoscope basically is a journal name and that is what we are going to be looking at. Now, what we have seen today up till now in the total internal reflection is we saw that there is another technique to find the refractive index. We looked at the refractive index. Refractive index, according to Snell's law, is sin i divided by sin r. Refractive index also can be found out by finding the speed of light in air 
and dividing by the speed of light in a medium. Of course, finding the speed of light in air and medium is not a very easy task. It requires specialized techniques and it's quite cumbersome. And therefore, because it has been demonstrated that this is so, therefore, the, what we do is we just use the refractive index to find the speed of light. However, in order to find the refractive index, we have a different technique in which we said the refractive index is known is as the is equal to 1 divided by sine of the critical angle. Critical angle was defined as the angle at which the light coming out of a denser medium into a lighter medium is just parallel to the surface of the medium or the boundary. Now from the this we also came to a deep aspect of total internal reflection so that if this angle at which the light is coming trying to emerge from a denser medium to a lighter medium is greater than the critical angle then we have total internal reflection and then we looked at the differences between reflection and refraction we said in reflection a the medium remains the same so you light bounces back into the same medium whereas in refraction the medium changes you might have air here and you might have water or oil or some other material glass plastic on the other side so the medium changes and therefore a the medium remains same in reflection it is different in refraction b in reflection the angle of incidence is equal to the angle of reflection whereas in refraction you have the sine of the incident angle divided by the sine of the refracted angle it gives you a constant which is known as the refractive index and c you have the law of reflection being incident angle, the reflected angle and the normal lie in the same plane in refraction, the incident angle, the reflected angle and the normal again lie on the same plane. Now let's pose a few questions. A. Why is no power or minimum power lost in optical fibers? Now in optical fibers basically are transparent material and as we know about transparent material there is no energy loss so light entering a transparent material passes through a transparent material as if it has not interacted there is minimum energy loss in a transparent material that is why optical fibers we say they do not lose that much energy and we can then use very low energy light to transmit images or information over very long distances can another question which normally students ask is can total internal reflection take place if light is coming from air and entering water? Can total internal reflection here so that no light enters water? In this case, the answer is no, because for total internal reflection, we have to have light coming from a denser material entering into a lighter material because air has got less density than water. Therefore, we say total internal reflection cannot take place. A third question, another normal question which students ask is, can we take photographs of the image obtained using an optical fiber? The answer is yes. Optical fibers create real images and therefore they can be photographed. Like we said, you have a real image and a virtual image. A real image is something which can be photographed. A virtual image cannot be photographed because it is not a real image. Just like an image in a mirror, yes, I can see my reflection. The reflection can be photographed. But when I go behind a mirror, there is nothing there. That is why we say that image is virtual. It cannot be photographed. Now we are going to be looking at a use of refraction. A refraction is used to make lenses. Lenses basically are media which allow us to bend light to and put it to useful purposes. Lenses are basically transparent objects which are used to converge or diverge rays of light. There are two, there are many types of lenses. However, the two basic type of lenses which we are going to be discussing are convex lens and concave lenses. Now, I have two lenses here for you. Now, one of these is a convex lens, the other is a concave lens. How do you identify between these two lenses? which is convex and which is concave. Now, if I look at this lens, it is thinner at the top and thicker at the center. 
Now, a lens which is thinner at the edges and thicker at the center is a convex lens. This lens is used to converge rays. So if we have a parallel beam of light entering at this point, this light will converge and meet at a point. Because this light is being converged, this is sometimes known as a converging lens. And this is a convex lens. Convex means bulging out. This on the other hand is thicker at the ends. This lens is thicker at the ends, however thinner at the center and therefore this is a concave lens. This is concave to concave surfaces. It is thinner at the center and thicker at the edges. Therefore we term this type of lens as a concave lens. Now a concave lens is also known as a diverging lens. So in other words, a parallel beam of light, if enters this lens, it is going to diverge and it is going to move outwards. So this is also known as a diverging lens. Now on your slides, basically I have given you representations of what is exactly is happening. First you have a converging lens. In a converging lens, the ray of light is coming, entering into the lens and it is converging at a point which is point F. Now, in case of a diverging lens, the beam of light enters the lens and it is diverged. So, a person standing on the left of the lens, on the right of the lens, depending upon your perspective, he is looking into the lens, he will presume that this is light is coming out of a point F behind the lens. The F in these cases, the point where the light converges or appear to converges, is known as the main focal point of the lens. Just like in the mirrors, we said F is the focal point and the distance from F to the center of the lens is the focal length. Let us, what we're going to be looking at now is how to use ray diagrams to depict what is happening in a lens. The two rules which we are going to be using, of course, just like in mirrors, A, the rule is any ray which is parallel to the principal axis, that is the line which is passing from the center of the lens, is going to be parallel ray is going to meet at the focus. The second point, which we are going to be using, just like in mirrors, in the mirror we said a ray which is passing through the pole. In this case, we say the ray which is going to pass from the optical center of the lens, that is the central point of the lens, passes through undeflected. It is not deflected because, remember, a ray of light which falls at 90 degrees is going to go through a material as if it is not refracted. It is going to continue in the same path. The same is the way that if I drop a coin into from air into water, if I have dropped it absolutely straight, it continues absolutely straight. However, if I drop it at an angle, it is refracted. The same thing happens with light. So anything which is passing through the optical center of the lens goes through unrefracted. These two properties of light allow us to formulate our ray diagrams for a lens. Now, what I have shown you on the diagram is a convex lens, whereas OA is the objective and IB is the image, where the lens is indicated. The AM is a ray which is parallel to the principal axis. The principal axis, of course, is OI. And after being reflected at the point M, it passes through the focal point and the cuts the line, which is AP, because AP is passing through the optical center. It will not be bent. Therefore, the, where the two meet is where the image is going to be formed. Now, let's do the definitions of certain terms which we are going to be using when we solve this problem. We say the principal focus is the point where the rays of light converge or appear to converge. The principal axis is the line joining the center of curvature with the optical center. And the optical center, of course, is the center of the lens. And a ray which is passing through this point does not bend where the focal length is the distance from F to the optical center. P is the distance of the object, that is the distance from O to the optical center is the distance P. And whereas Q is known as the image distance, it is the distance from, from the image to the optical center. We are now, if the ray of light are parallel to the axis, it is reflected in such a way that light appears to come from the principal focus and the image formed can be formed on the screen and images in certain cases are also real. Now in case of a convex lens, if you have a real image, we consider the focal length to be positive 
because the image is on one side of the lens, the object is on the other side of the lens. We consider this to be the zero zero of a number line. Therefore, the image distance is considered to be negative. The objective distance is considered to be positive, And of course, the focal length is considered to be positive. Now, on the diagram, basically what I have stated is that you have the OP is the object distance and PI is the image distance where the focal length is basically given by the distance F. Now, a refraction from a convex lens is what we've indicated. Now, let us try and formulate a the lens equation. If you look at our diagram, which we have just discussed, where you have two triangles, one triangle is APO, the other triangle is PIB, these two triangles would be similar because angle IPB and angle APO are identical triangles being vertically opposite angles, whereas BIP and POA are both right angles. Here now we have two angles, two triangles, identical, the third angle is automatically equal, so we have two triangles which are similar. If the two triangles are similar, then the sides have to be in the same ratio. This is the rule of similar triangles, so therefore that tells us OA divided by IB is going, is going to be equal to OP divided by IP, and that gives us MP divided by IB is equal to PF divided by IF, giving us Rearranging, we find that the focal length divided by Q minus the focal length should be equal to P over Q. And if we rearrange them, just like in the mirror equation, we find that 1 over P plus 1 over Q is equal to 1 over F. Now, this would strike a chord because this is identical to what the mirror equation gave us. Now, distinguishing between a convex mirror and a concave mirror, we did this. In the last lecture, let us recap it. So in a concave mirror, the physical bulge is inward. In a convex mirror, the physical bulge was outwards. The reflecting surface in a concave mirror was inside. The reflecting surface of a concave mirror was outside. When a parallel beam fell on a concave mirror, it converged. When a parallel beam fell on a convex mirror, it diverged. The focal length in case of a concave mirror was taken as positive. In case of a convex mirror, it was taken as negative. The image distance in a concave mirror was taken as positive. In image distance in case of a concave mirror is also taken as positive. The image, the object distance in case of a concave mirror is taken as positive, and in case of a convex mirror is taken as negative. This is substituted in the lens in the mirror equation, allowing us to do the different problems. Now when we look at the convex lens and a concave lens, of course, a convex lens converges light, a concave lens diverges light. In a convex lens, the focal length is positive. In a concave lens, the focal length is taken as negative, very simply because we have a virtual image in case of a concave lens. The image distance is negative in case of a convex lens. Image distance is positive in case of a concave lens. The principal focus is real in both cases because the focal length is known. In a convex lens, the image can be obtained on screen, depends upon where you place the object. In case of a concave lens, the image cannot be obtained on a screen. Now, the similarities between concave and convex lenses are both use the principle of refraction. Both are transparent. The convex lens and the concave lens, because both the light passes through them, Therefore, they have to be transparent. And in both cases, a ray which passes through the optical center does not suffer any refraction. Both can be used to manipulate the size of the image, and the size of the image and the size of the object basically would be different. And the object distance is considered positive for both cases. In both cases, we have the lens equation, which is 1 over P plus 1 over Q is equal to 1 over F, which is the lens equation and it can be derived using a concave lens. Of course, the, when you replace the pluses and the minuses, like we have said, and the same equation, the same formulation which we used for a convex lens and in a concave lens, what you are going to get is the same equation. However, the focal length in a concave lens is minus and the image distance is given by a minus sign and by a negative sign. Now, if you look at the mirror equation and the lens equation, you find that they are identical. 
In other words, a mirror and lens behave similarly. The only difference in basically being a mirror reflects whereas a lens transmits. So a lens, the image is formed on the other side, whereas in the mirror, the image might be formed on the same side if you're using a concave mirror and a convex lens. It also depends upon what type of mirror you're using, what type of lens you are using. The lens formula is very, very important. It allows us, without actually going, looking at different lenses and doing a demonstration or a practical, calculate on a piece of paper what type of lens is required for what type of instrument and we can construct a different instruments or materials and it allows us to determine the type of spectacles a person uses and so on and so forth. Now, we have looked at critical angle, we have looked at reflection, we have looked at refraction. We have looked at two different types of... Um, we, today what we have looked at is two different types. We looked at refraction when the light passed from one medium into another medium. We said that when light moves from medium A to medium B, it changes its direction, its speed changes, and it is refracted. We are going to be continuing this discussion as we go into the last lecture, or the next lecture which we have is going to be the last of the series of this, of this physics, and we are going to wrap up, do a few problems, and try to emphasize what exactly we have studied here. Thank you very much.